without plants, life on Earth as we know it would cease to exist. Especially in urban areas, vegetation plays an enormous role in maintaining a healthy community. Although the appearance of the urban forest may differ somewhat from one region to another, it provides many of the same aesthetic, environmental, economic, and ecological benefits. And in urban areas, not only are plants responsible for maintaining human health, but humans are also responsible for ensuring that the urban forest will remain a vibrant system capable of continuing to provide a host of benefits for us all. Unlike a wild forest where vegetation dominates the living community and humans are only visitors, the urban forest is dominated by humans and the importance of other living organisms is sometimes forgotten. The threats to the health of our urban forest are many. Some of them, like tree topping, can be readily addressed by public education programs that help people understand why practices that reduce or destroy the forest canopy are detrimental to community health. Here, where a business had continually topped a row of pin oaks to provide visibility for its signs, the injured trees were removed and replaced with new trees, which will be allowed to mature naturally. The business sign could be lowered, or as the trees mature, lower limbs could be removed to ensure adequate visibility. These trees had been lollipopped, that is, pruned into balls, for years. The trees are on public property where such pruning is forbidden, so rehabilitation was in order. After some sensitive pruning to restore their leaders, the trees are on their way to full recovery and in just a few years will look normal again. Public education needs to address not only the tops of trees, but also the bottoms, that is, the roots. Most tree roots are found in only the top foot or two of soil, and construction activities in that area often severely damage trees by compacting the soil and driving oxygen out. Crown dieback in mature trees is often indicative of damage that occurred to their roots a few months or even years before. This type of damage is preventable, and most sensitive developers who understand the importance of retaining healthy, established trees will provide the protection needed to prevent damage to these great assets. To ensure complete protection, a sturdy fence needs to be erected at or beyond the tree's drip line until construction is completed, at which time it can be safely removed. Just as important as public education in protecting the tops and bottoms or the crowns and the roots of trees, is learning how to better design our urban forest, recognizing the biological needs of trees as well as the benefits they provide. The larger a tree's canopy, the more benefits it provides to the community. In the past, some designers would regard a narrow setback such as this suitable only for narrow columnar trees, when in fact large trees succeed admirably, admirably on the site. On the other hand, on sites such as this, where there is plenty of overhead room for large canopy trees, columnar cultivars of red maple were planted. And the idea that many people have had in the past about how far apart to plant trees needs to perhaps be re-examined. These mature eucalyptus trees are perfectly healthy, yet some of them are planted only eight to 10 feet apart. When planning tree plantings in urban areas, we also need to consider what's below ground. These sweet gums on well-drained soil have relatively deep roots, and the tree lawn area remains quite even. But on this poorly drained site, on heavy clay, sweet gums of the same age as those in the previous slide stand on their tippy toes with all their roots growing near the surface, creating a tree lawn that in some places is almost two feet above the surrounding grade. In some areas, we need to recognize that trees are unable to grow. These lindens were planted where the native soil had been severely compacted and rubble was used as fill. Until those conditions are addressed, it's a waste of time and money to try to get trees to grow here. A glance at what's going on in Western European urban forests can give us some fresh ideas about planning our own future urban forests. Western European cities face some of the same problems we do, and much is now being done to address the threats to the urban forest. Europeans have begun to address urban forestry issues more aggressively, partly because of the effects of acidic pre precipitation, which are now widely understood. And dying forests in some areas of Europe have spurred many people and municipalities into action. There is also a greater tradition of protecting nature, especially in Northern Europe. 
Here in a city park in Uppsala, Sweden, motorized vehicles are even per forbidden to prevent disturbing the area's tranquility. Instead, park workers use horse-drawn wagons to haul materials and collect trash. A common problem in many older cities is narrow streets where for years it was said that trees could not be planted. Along once lovely boulevards in some cities where trees could be planted, the health of those trees is now threatened as demand for parking space results in paving of their root zones. Yet here in Zurich, Switzerland, an innovative balance has been struck between trees and autos on a narrow, older street by building beds that extend out into the street, permitting the planting of large canopy London plane trees. Where trees cannot be planted, architects and planners employ an abundance of shrubs and vines to provide some of the aesthetic and environmental benefits usually provided by trees. And in shopping centers, some city codes require as much as 30% of the land area to be planted to ensure a healthy environment for both the plants and the public. In Bern, Switzerland, perforated drain pipe is now standard in downtown tree plantings where it ensures that air will be available to the new tree's roots so they will thrive despite their proximity to so much pavement. And parking areas, instead of being paved with impervious asphalt, are being constructed with perforated concrete units that permit both air and water to get to the tree's roots. The contemporary approach to tree planting in many European cities can best be summed up in just three words, big, native, and diverse. Because large trees provide more benefits to a community than do small ones, they are more desirable if their health can be ensured until they reach a large size. Small trees such as these globe Norway maples are gradually being replaced, where appropriate, by trees that will become much larger. An increasing dependence on native plants reflects a greater understanding of the great role native plants can play in maintaining the balance of nature, even in urban areas. Here, amid enormous apartment complexes outside of Stockholm, Sweden, the planted areas among the buildings are devoted almost exclusively to native trees, shrubs, and other plants. Such plantings are considered by some to provide a greater, quote, sense of place, unquote, as they fit in better with the surrounding natural landscape. Diverse plantings, such as this one in Bern, Switzerland, are a surprise to some people. What appears to be a single species of tree lining this street is in fact a mixture of six different species of elm, linden, oak, maple, and London plain. Plantings such as this one with evenly spaced trees of the same species are becoming a thing of the past as we learn more about the importance of species diversity in urban plantings. Newer plantings, such as this boulevard in western France, demonstrate this more sensitive approach. Diversity also involves providing a variety of habitats, not just trees. In Bern, Switzerland, where once there was asphalt right up to these tree trunks, the asphalt has been removed and replaced with a variety of grasses and legumes that are mowed just once a year. Back in the U.S., too, there is much we can do to address design problems regarding the urban forest. As we understand more about the needs of trees, plantings like this should become a thing of the past. Still, we find abundant examples of plantings that ignore biological fact. Here, a large metal cylinder is being buried to ensure that the new tree's roots will go down deep below the parking lot and not raise the curbs or asphalt nearby. Unfortunately, because tree roots will find no air down so deep, they'll probably grow in circles around the new tree near the surface, eventually strangling and killing it. Since most of our trees on public property grow in tree lawns, that area between the curb and the sidewalk, we need to take more care to protect the existing native soil there during construction. It is possible to carefully build sidewalk ramps in the vicinity of established trees, but perhaps a better solution would be to do it a little farther away from the trunks. One solution to protecting the root zones in tree lawns is by planting ground covers or low shrubs that protect the soil, that do not compete as much with tree, tree roots as grass does, and that are easy to maintain. Another solution is a mixture of paving blocks set on sand and ground covers. Where space may not permit large trees next to buildings, a boulevard planting strip may be the best solution, but preferably one wider than this one in Seattle. After all, if we can build a car lane or sidewalk 
to an adequate width. We can do the same for tree planting areas. Conifers are a superb addition to plantings in appropriate climates, such as in the Northwest. Although they may cause some visual obstruction when young, since one cannot limb them up like deciduous trees, they eventually can be limbed up quite high, providing a wonderful green canopy year-round and extending the period during which tree leaves can provide environmental benefits in urban areas. Where sidewalk and tree conflicts develop, the sidewalk can always be moved. Better yet, brick pavers can be laid down that obstruct root growth less than concrete. Where overhead utility wires still exist, trees that will mature at a height below the wires are more appropriate than large canopy trees, which must then be regularly topped. In park areas, rather than scattering tree plantings across a grassy area, trees might better be grouped in large beds, making maintenance of the area easier and protecting young tree trunks from mowers and other machinery. The planting of trees surrounded by metal grates often causes more problems than it solves. If adequate open ground around the tree cannot be provided, a more suitable solution might be something like this. Still, it's asking a lot of the new tree roots to colonize the soil beneath the surrounding pavement, to pavement which is probably compacted and relatively low in oxygen and water. The best solution is to plant trees in large beds and then mulch those beds to prevent grass from competing with the new tree roots as they, be, as they become established. Here, volunteers have spaded the entire tree lawn area without removing the existing turf and are applying newspapers and then a top layer of compost to ensure that the turf will not grow back. Then, the area is sown to winter cover crops of wheat, clover, and snow peas to protect the soil prevent trampling of the area, and help improve the soil. The following spring, the cover crops will be turned under and replaced by longer-lasting, more suitable plants. It's important to fence off new plantings in urban areas, at least for the first year or so, until plantings begin to get established. When staking and guying new trees, never use wire, even if it is covered with hose. A better approach is to use wooden stakes and heavy rope to hold the new tree, removing them after the first year. The conventional way to water new trees has been to build a small saucer near the tree's base, which is filled with water that percolates down to the root zone. The disadvantage of this system is that it encourages new root growth only near the trunk instead of farther out from the tree. By doing away with the saucer, new roots are encouraged to colonize a wider area much more rapidly. Parking lots present special problems. Here, where six large existing trees could have been incorporated into a mini park, they were instead relegated to separate little islands in a sea of asphalt. The damage to their root zones during construction was considerable, so survival is doubtful. Not only will the trees look bad as they decline over the next few years, but the developer will also look bad, and the entire community will lose when, with a little more planning and thought, these trees could have lived for many more decades. The traditional approach to parking lot plantings consists of lozenge-shaped beds that simply cannot provide adequate growing space for trees. Often, the soil that the trees are planted in is just a thin layer covering the rubble left after construction. It's no wonder the trees have to struggle to survive. A parking lot such as this one is not at all inviting. This one, on the other hand, was well designed and planted and is a delight to use. The ultimate parking lot would, of course, incorporate the use of grasscrete or similar products to permit the parking of cars as well as the growth of grass. Another important part of our urban forest, the open grasslands and meadows, are often neglected or treated in an unimaginative fashion. Note the difference here between the manicured lawn to the right and the rich riverside vegetation to the left. Such areas provide essential wildlife habitat so important for maintaining some balance of nature in urban settings. We will always need mowed, grassy areas for sitting or walking or playing games, but we also need to remember that people aren't the only creatures living in the urban forest, and letting meadows develop in some areas provides far more benefits both to people and to wildlife than the area would if it were regularly mowed. By just reducing the use of herbicides in public parks, the result is often spectacular, 
such as here where English lawn daisies, dandelions, and creeping veronica provide a colorful break to the green monotony of a conventional lawn. Lastly, when drainage ditches or small creeks have been neglected for decades, just keeping the mowers or brush choppers away for a couple seasons can result in the development of a biologically rich assemblage of plants and animals and provide as well a great outdoor classroom for nature study. Once we understand the importance of the urban forest and how we might better design our cities with the urban forest in mind, our communities will become healthier, happier places for people and trees to live in.